And that was so long ago, wasn't it? <laughs> but, um, thank you very much, and thank you very much indeed. Um, yes, I'm going to try to talk about Charles Beard and the Constitution, whether the Constitution has any coherent, relevant response to that. Part of the part of the difficulty of talking about that issue is what's the Constitution supposed to do? Is it an empowering document or a limiting document or a bit of both? Does it have a, a life of its own and what is a living Constitution? And we must remember that from the very beginning, want, and also in our own life, once we make a statement, it's either a written statement or an oral statement, we really no longer own that. Somebody else owns it and interprets it and we've been, we must be in several rooms where where somebody says, oh, he said this, oh, no, he said this, all, all the disagreements, and they're decent people, they're not making, making this up. Um, we need to have your place, how come you don't have power over your place? <laughs> we should put him on the other side. Let's go this way. Introduction is a lousy one. You're doing it all. Uh, full, full service, full service, that's what we do. <laughs> There's some people getting ready to come in and their name is on a, is on a classroom down the hall, so I thought I'd tell you why they're... Where do we want? Is that okay? I better tell this joke before everybody comes in. <laughs> One of the requirements every couple of years Pepperdine is there is a, something called Pepperdine uh, University Sexual Harassment Online Training Course. And we have to take that every two years and it'll require that you take it for two hours. You can't take it for one hour, 48 minutes, or one hour, 49 minutes. You, it has to be for two hours. And you think, well, why is that? And, well, the answer in part is lawyers. And one's covering oneself. And there's a whole bunch of reasons, but it's very interesting how we turn those kinds of questions over to a, an administrative unit. Now, I always lack, like to laugh at myself or when I make a joke or, or make a big error. But there's only one thing that comes close to laughing at myself is laughing at um, pompous uh, elites who think that they're such technocrats. Now you know for a fact that Pepperdine University sexual harassment uh, online training cannot appear. I mean they send that to you but that's not what's going to appear on, on the shortened version. And so what is it that happened? It comes out of Pepperdine University online sex. <laughs> and of course, if they get everybody clicking, clicking, clicking <laughs> immediately for for you know, noon arousal. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's really very interesting, and so which means they didn't intend that at all. But it says, but once you've stated it, you can't you you can't control it anymore, right? So when there's something absolutely joyful. And, and you know what it says? Don't respond. Don't respond. Which is, makes it even funnier when you think about it because then they send it to you again. Don't respond. Well, now, the case against Charles Beard in many ways is the case against the administrative state. And the problem with the administrative state is that the whole nature, we know what you don't know. We know what's good for you. This is the way you're going to do it. There's nothing that you can do by yourself. It has to be administered and regulated. Um, that's gone into the private sector. And even though Charles Beard has long gone, his memory lives on. If I, so, I, I want to talk less about Charles Beard's particular work than the impact of Charles Beard. And I just use one example in terms of what is the Constitution supposed to do? The answer is we can't control the language. We think we can, but even with and or, or, or becomes a difficulty. It says cruel and unusual punishment. It doesn't say cruel or unusual punishment. So with a very, very simple thing like and or or, we can, we can get ourselves into difficulty. So we need to be careful 
about how we say it, what we say it, and even then there are going to be people, decent people, who are going to interpret things very differently. What I thought I would do very quickly would be to show you the four parts of this, of this website, which has taken most of the 20th century to, to 20, and 21st century to, uh, to, to create. Uh, the first one is the Constitutional Convention. The second one is the Federalist anti federalist debate. The third one is the ratification of the Constitution. And the fourth one is the Bill of Rights. Um, it's not my task today to take you through e each of these four, but I invite you to explore um, all four together if you want uh, a, a basic introduction to what is called the American founding and out of respect for my dear colleague Ted, it's all lowercase rather than uppercase the American founding. Um, that's a private joke which he will tell you because I don't get it. <laughs> Uh, the, the Constitutional Convention is what I want to focus on immediately. So if we click on that and we go to the um, lower, lower left and you will see, get to one, more, one more scroll down, that the signing of the Constitution which occurred uh, September the 17th, yesterday, you will see, if, if we go to the interactive scene at the signing of the Constitution, this is the famous Howard Christie, Chandler Christie painting, which appears on various mugs and other uh, <laughs> places. It's a, a painting which I think is the, the best of all the paintings on the founding, but it is not the most observed. The one that is most observed, we will see in a moment, is the Barry Faulkner uh, painting, which is in the National Archives. This hangs in Congress where no one goes. <laughs> 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 yes. Um, what this painting, among other things, shows is, is that there are um, curtains on the windows, but the light is there today because it's the signing, and the, the darkness has gone, and politics loves darkness, and the progressive historians, including but not limited to Charles Beard, make a great deal of the setting and the room and the closing of the curtains, all the better to shaft you, my dear. Which means, in other words, that the very founding, as is presented by Charles Beard and fellow travelers, is that America is ill-founded. It is founded in the dark. It is founded um, with an intent somehow not to illuminate uh, but rather to confiscate, or to, um, well, we can go on with these eightings, but you've got the point. And that, and that George Washington is at the, at, at the front, the high, and in front here we've got three people who are taken out of their particular delegations. One is Hamilton. Yeah, by the way, what I like about this is, is Sam, if you just, it tells you who it is, and uh, then you can click on Hamilton. Uh, this is very good for our 25-year-old student. Um, if you click on Hamilton, it'll give you a, a rendition of Hamilton's work at the Constitutional Convention. That's for each of the delegates. But let's go back. But, so you've got Hamilton, Franklin, Madison. These are the three super delegates, so to speak, that, uh, that Christie has brought out of the regular seating arrangement. And, uh, this painting by Christie was done during the 1930s. And so at one level you can see it's sort of political and commemorative, namely it's the 150th anniversary of the Constitution. Every single regime has collapsed in the history of the world. And why would we not think that America would not follow that route? And if you then add the event of the Great Depression to the actual commemoration of the 150th anniversary, you've got, um, you've got a problem on your hands. Is this the day that, that America sees its fate? And so that the background, the historical background, is not only the 150th anniversary, but the question of will a commercial society collapse? Will um, will a regime dedicated to the blessings of liberty perish? However one wants to, to, to put that kind of issue. It is not just, you had enough, 
Thank you. Good. Now I can really behave. So, so, the, so the question is, what do you, what is being portrayed? It's an interpretation, and it's, a, it's an interpretation of, of of an event, the signing of the Constitution through Christie's eyes, with three superdelegates in Washington on top. But what the progressives, and I think Christie is part of that progressive movement, is attempting to is attempting to show, is that it really doesn't matter what the conversation was at that time. What really matters is that Hamilton is important, even though his importance derived from subsequent events in 1787. Of the 88 days, he was only there 44. Franklin, his his strength comes from what he did before the convention, and then there's poor little Jimmy Madison, who you have to shove in there somewhere. So the, this, this, this is a red thing, but the most important thing that I want to mention is the, is the idea of it's done in private. And that the, that the, um, that the event and the whole, the whole signing is somehow a potentially subversive event. The hero, the hero to the extent there's a hero for these early progressives is Jefferson, because Jefferson was the only one who was interested in transparency at that particular time. The response came from Madison. There will be a time to talk about this outside during the ratification. Here's the time to build sort of group solidarity without group think. And I think they succeeded because in the end three people decided not to, uh, not to sign. And they were invited to go for dinner uh, and uh, have drinks at, at the end. And which means that always that a conversation took place. And, and, and you can disagree with each other over such a monumental event as this. And why is it monumental? Never before in the history of the world has an assembly like this been selected for the purpose of trying to create a more perfect union. Not a perfect union, but a more perfect union. This is not Plato's imaginary republic. This is an actual republic that is trying to be created. And among people from a diverse background, and they are there for 88 days during the summer of, of, of 1787, and not a drop of blood was spilled. And it seems to me that's what we ought to be commemorating. That seems to be something to be celebrating. But I'm think, what, what I'm getting at is that Charles Beard, among a number of historic progressive historians, managed to find something wrong. And if instead of saying, look at that painting, look what it contains, its potentiality, Never before has this happened. I received a very disturbing telephone call about a year or so ago from someone who said to me, my daughter has just come back from class in the 10th grade or something, and they, they, they're, using your, they're using your website. I said, that's great. I don't think that's a calamity. And they said, well, no, but let me ask you what the key question was during the, during the session. And I said, what was it? He said, we used the Christie painting, and the key question was, what's wrong with that painting? And the answer went down. There's no black people, there are no women, there's no transgender, there's no homosexuals. There's, no. There's, um, or, in other words, identity defined by the modern lens suggests that there's nothing that we can learn from these people because they're all white, male, and probably well off. And that's reading history backwards. Founders don't complete things. Founders lay foundations. Framers do not put in carpets. Framers put up the frame so that it withstands all the, all the nasty winds that come along and the hail and everything like that. Self-government is a perpetual business of self-reliance and self-governing. What the issues are are not determined. The Constitutional Convention did not create um, uh, the Koran. It created a framework within which self-governing people could govern themselves with dignity and secure the blessings of liberty for themselves and for posterity. To ask the question, what is wrong with this painting, is to ask the wrong question. But that is the question that Charles Beard asked. So that if I were to just move from that point to um, the delegates, we were to go, if we go to the delegates, by the way, Sam is, says, Yes. She was on Reagan last night. I gave a talk at the Reagan Library, and uh, Sam and Emily were, were, were there and uh, right on the job. So if we go to the delegates, uh, what we could do, 
what I would love to do would be to say, for example, take a look at the age of the delegates. And if we say, how many people are in their 20s? Four of them. Look at who are in their 30s. The movers and shakers are in their 30s. Randolph, Gouverneur Morris, James Madison, uh, Luther Martini, um, there's uh, all, kinds of, <laughs> all kinds of other people. And then, and then I mean, even though... Now, I'll tell you something. If the, fr if the framers wanted you to have that cell phone on, they would have said so. <laughs> the fact that they remained silent on that issue shows that they didn't like it. <laughs> does, the, does, the does the silence of the Constitution empower you, or does it limit you? All right. Um, <laughs> but the main bunch of people are in the third. I find that an interesting question. Could we go through the Constitution Convention and use age as an independent variable on a whole range of issues to figure out whether or not on immigration, whether or not on the vote, whether or not on dealing with new states coming into the Union, we might want to treat the new states as equal over against unequal. To what extent does age matter in this conversation? To what extent, for example, just to add it, to what extent does being an immigrant. There are seven immigrants out of the 55 who decided to go. I've known of no country in the history of the world who would permit immigrants to sit around the table and to talk about it. Talk, talk about what kind of country they're going to have uh, and, and, and live in. And then make an exception for them to become president. Everybody after has got to be a, a, a native, uh, natural born. But it, it, and, and you can say, well, they know such and such. But there were, there were three Catholics in the room. You can think, well, if there were only three, well, wait a minute, you start somewhere. Take a look at Philadelphia and the churches. There are two Catholic churches there in Philadelphia in the 1780s, one by the wretched Jesuits and the other one by some other people. And all the blessings of liberty to, to Mr. <laughs> to the dear Monsignor in France. But we could look at, we could look at age as a, as, a, as a variable, or we could go back. I, I, the delegates again. Or we could say, um, uh, what the heck are you? Um, educational background. Yeah, I mean, they read a lot. They, they did a lot of thinking. And if we, if we, if we go down the, let's see, who went to Harvard, to Yale, to Princeton. Princeton was, uh, as, as, as Professor McAllister knows, it was a terrific, terrific place, and it was the Founders' Institution. Now, notice, not everybody from Princeton came from, who went, attended Princeton came from New Jersey. It was an intercontinental place. Madison went there from Virginia. And um, if you go out there, look at them. Um, uh, it's, it's, so there were a variety of places you go, and so there's an intercontinental experience that they gave, and this was real college, I mean, they did Latin. <laughs> Help them on their crossword puzzle. So, the, the, so we, we could look at education. To what extent is education an interesting variable when trying to understand the work of the framers? Or, a third one, we could take a look at, for example, um, the delegates' continental experience. So, for example, how many people signed the Declaration of Independence? How many people served in the Continental Congress which means from 1774 to, to 1780, 1781? You can go down. How many people served in the state, state constitution? These people helped write state constitutions, which, which occurred between 1776 and 1780. Uh, the 13 colonies became 13 states, and these people had experience writing constitutions. Uh, who signed the Articles of Confederation? Uh, yeah, there you go. And in other words, uh, who served the Confederation? And, and then after, who went to the, to the ratifying conventions? Who went up to the new federal court? I mean, one could, in other words, do a political understanding of experience de dealing with constitutional politics. But that's not what Charles Beard does. Let me show you what Charles Beard thinks is the, not just single most important, variable, but the only one that matters. That everything I've just done over the last five minutes can be thrown away. So if we were to take a look 
go back to a, to a, right, and we go to the delegates, and we hit occupations of the delegates. This is what Beard is interested in. So, public security interests, lending and investments, keep going, real estate and land speculation, planters and slaveholders. That knowledge of those four sub-variables will tell you all you really need to know about the Constitution. The Constitution is epiphenomenal. The Constitution is derivative. It is the dependent variable. The words don't matter. Language doesn't count. Thoughts don't count. What counts is the material conditions under which you live. It's a soft, soft Marxism of which the progressives have the element. It's not just saying that economics matters. It is that knowing these economic um, components will tell you all you need to know. Thus, I don't read the contract clause or the property clause in the Constitution as an idea. as comes down through common law and due process and judge-made law and what it is that you read John Locke. I mean, that's a whole bunch of total nonsense. What I need to know is who owns and who doesn't own property. And that will tell me virtually everything that I need to know. And that is the Charles Beard contribution. Now that has been thoroughly attacked in the 1950s. Forrest MacDonald and other people have thoroughly attacked it. But in doing so, they're bought into the Beard thesis. Namely, that the economic question is the most important question. It, I, I, because Forrest MacDonald, for example, will tell you that the deals that were made at the convention were deals that were made through land speculators, etc. It's just that they weren't as, the folks weren't as nasty as Beard tries to portray them. They were just smart people. And their smartness was even in terms of their entrepreneurship. But the whole notion of politics is an independent variable. Of education is an independent variable isn't there in Beard. And that's what I want to, in effect, challenge. And so when I say, um, what, what does the Constitution tell us about economic theory, I'm trying to stand Beard on his head. I'm not saying economics doesn't matter. But what I am saying is the following. That the kind of economics that will come out of the Constitution, that, that is linked to the Constitution, requires language and um, some kind of argument. For example, a much overlooked power in, of, of Congress, in Article 1, Section 8, where you will go to, to, uh, to, to find the powers of Congress. There are 18 there listed, nine of them deal with Congress. And one of the ones that are is overlooked is that um, the, the copies of the Constitution, for those of you who don't know it by heart, uh, that, 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 uh, that it, it says that Congress shall have the power to um, encourage the development of the useful arts and sciences. And, and to that end, shall, uh, shall, shall award patents on a temporary basis. Uh, now that seems to me to show that we're interested in a commercial society. That because the whole idea of developing the arts and sciences is clearly against Rousseau, clearly against the so-called primitive and simplistic fig leaf life, it is an attempt to improve the human condition through, through practical arts and sciences like agriculture, business, law, and that is in there. Uh, and we don't spend enough attention to it. That's, I think, what we should do, regardless of whether these folks were have landed interests or mercantile interests or whatever it is. The fact that they came to an agreement concerning this country is going to be a commercial society which means that in a commercial society, you're going to get hustlers. You're going to get all kinds of things. You need to know how to tell good commerce from bad commerce. And what is it about commerce that's supposed to be decent? And the answer is, it improves our human condition. So saith Smith, so saith um, uh, Locke, so saith, I'm going to argue, the American founders. It has nothing to do I'm to get at, as rich versus poor or the proletariat, which didn't exist, 
over against the capitalist. I mean, that is, you're talking about an imported European model to explain early America. That's, in effect, what Beard has done. And the French Revolution looms very heavily over that. that, uh, that, that, that there's a certain sense, Ted, Ted and I were talking about this recently, is that where do you stand on the relationship between the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution? It seems to me that that is a profound, profoundly important question of uh, under the American narrative, and you can flip the Bill of Rights in there in, into that mix. And the early progressives understood the Constitution of the United States to be a thermidorean, that's a French Revolution word, thermidorean reaction to the Declaration, which meant that it was a counter-revolutionary document over against the Declaration, which was a democratic document of the people. And, and, and notice, the argument goes on, that the Declaration of Independence says life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. It does not say property. Whereas the Constitution, the key word there is to protect private property. So saith Madison in Federalist 10. So saith the Fifth Amendment. Uh, which, of course, it can only be taken away by due process of law, which means we can take away your property as long as the takings is in accordance with um, L.A. County Code or something like that. You know, to just follow the right process, we can take it from you. In other words, for the Beard folks and for the progressives, a regime which is dedicated to the preservation of private property is automatically, by definition, an anti-democratic regime. Because property is in terms of who owns and who doesn't own. And 20% of the people own 80% of the property, and 80% of the people own 20% of the property. By definition, a regime dedicated to private property is automatically an oligarchic reactionary regime. Now, the fact that the Declaration does not have uh, property in there is, 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 shall we say, is overreaching by the progressives because the, the Declaration of Independence is very, very similar to the Virginia Declaration of Rights, which was written by Mason and uh, Madison signed on to it, so did Jefferson. And, uh, and it was written, in fact, before the Declaration of Independence. And it says there the right to life, liberty, uh, pursuit of happiness, and property. And the Declaration does not pretend that those three, life, liberty, pursuit of happiness, are exhaustive. It says um, um, among, among which are. Uh, and I just wish that, Jeff, that, that uh, sort of Jefferson had written another paragraph for example, but then that gets you to Madison's problem. Start listing, you forget one, you enter a new, in a new set of problems. Uh, that is, what is a constitution supposed to do and say? It leaves your hands, you don't own it anymore. Um, so there was one set of progressives who thought the Declaration of Independence was democratic over against the constitution, which was undemocratic. And the key was where do you stand on the property question? The absence of property in the Declaration Democratic. The presence of property in the Constitution, autocratic, oligarchic. Bam! All you need to know is the occupations of the delegates. And that tells you everything. And then there was a, another phase of, of the progressives, which uh, Ted has written about, in which there's a lot of emphasis on the living Constitution, which is post, sort of post-Beardian. And that emphasizes the preamble to the Constitution. All you need to know about the Constitution is we the people. And once you say that, we can do anything. The voice of the people is the voice of God, to, 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 re to, to refer to Rousseau. That is, mandates take place through four-year elections. The people have spoken. I am the president. My job is to carry this out. Constitutionalism, to the extent that it matters, is what we the people decided to be. So that there's a certain push then to have a living constitution. And a living constitution requires interpretation. Fascinating to me, the entire New Deal and great society programs came in based on interpretation of the, of the necessary and proper clause, the general welfare clause, the interstate commerce clause, the taxation clause. Not one amendment to introduce and secure that. That is all by interpretation. It's a certain cynical way of treating a constitution. In, 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 my, in, in my viewpoint. And uh, I have to admit that I don't think the role of the Supreme Court is to help a president uh, decide which clause of the Constitution he or she should use in order to get something through. Uh, but then again, there's potentiality 
in the document to go various ways, except if you read it closely, it's clearly committed to commercial society. That is arts and sciences, private property, um, tilts you in one direction, so that to tilt in another direction requires some very clever interpretation. I know there are certain law schools where stupid students have attended and they've told me that in constitutional law their final exam is take a clause of the Constitution and be as creative as you can be with this interpretation. Uh, that, what that shows me is that there's nothing there there and that all, all, all that matters is, 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 is your, particular, your, your particular interpretation of what matters. Um, I could go on and on, but time is sort of starting to run out, and I want to hear what you might, might have to say. Although Charles Beard has been challenged, although the progressive story has shifted from, say, the Declaration being democratic and the Constitution being anti-democratic to a living Constitution through which we can get a lot done, there, there's still, now in fact, we have a living Declaration. And that is, there, is no, there are no verities, there are no, uh, uh, the, all the particular stuff doesn't matter. The universals do matter, but, it mean, but they mean what we say it means. So we have a constitution which is whatever the court says it means, or whatever power says it means, and the declaration as to whatever we want it to mean. Interesting, Jefferson doesn't matter anymore with the declaration. I mean, that, that, that's the key. To the extent that Jefferson mattered, it was that Jefferson had an underdeveloped understanding of liberty. It was individualism. We're now communitarians. It's, it, it, I'm using terms loosely. And that it's, it's, it's national, uh, it, it's, it's sort of a community-based community rather than an individual liberty-based. The Constitution matters, yes, as long as it's a living Constitution. That is, the preamble is what matters in both documents. And that the Constitution then is not to be understood as some kind of restraining document, and that we could ignore the particulars, both of the Declaration and, and the Constitution. Um, well, what then, if that is the case, does the Constitution and the Declaration have to tell us in response? And uh, I, I will end on that note. And the, the, the response is, first of all, is it relevant, and secondly, is it, is it coherent? The, the relevance doesn't seem to be there because haven't we changed over the last 200 years isn't, wasn't that an agrarian community at one time? Wasn't that a simplistic community? All you have to do is to read Federalist 10 and Federalist 51 and, 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 and the exchange to understand and Adam Smith and to realize that they weren't simply creating a document to reflect the then existing reality. That's using Beer's interpretation that ideas don't matter. Ideas don't have consequences. Consequences have ideas. And that if you're really a founder or a framer, you don't create something that is an immediate reflection of what you have around you. You're trying to shape the discussion or shape the conversation about what's going to come down. Arts and sciences. One of the biggest things that the framers did was to create a free trade area. So that you did away with separate coinage, separate weights and measures, separate... Set. That's the extended market that, that Adam Smith called for, from New Hampshire all the way down to Georgia. Uh, that's an important constitutional contribution to economics. And if you read your Adam Smith, the, the wealth of a nation depends upon the productivity of labor, the productivity of labor depends upon the division of labor, the division of labor depends upon the extent of the market. Um, and part of what the Constitution does is to provide for an extension of the market and the extension of the market even further by the admission of new states. In, in, into, into that market. Now, how you want to organize them, et cetera, et cetera, is a different question, but it tilts. It tilts it. So, if you read Madison, it's the, the, uh, the well-being of the nation depends upon its wealth. The wealth, the productivity of its wealth depends upon the productivity of labor in a commercial society. The commercial society depends upon the division of interest. The division of interest depends upon the extent of the orbit. Um, that doesn't sound like class warfare. That sounds much more like um, uh, introducing a competitive commercial society. So that what you get from Madison, in a certain sense, is you got a competition between the federal government and the state government. You got a competition between Congress, the executive, and the judiciary. And you got a competition among the various interests in the community. 
competition at the core of a commercial society is what makes the blessings of liberty secure. Whereas, think for the progressives, cooperation. Uh, not competition. Competition is a bad word. Making profit is a bad word. Property is theft. Profit is theft. Therefore, <coughs> uh, pure service to the common good, led by experts trained in public policy or public administration with no particular interest or axe to grind. I mean, that's the model. To heck with separation of powers, we need the British parliamentary system. To heck with uh, independent judiciary, what we need are experts. Well, um, that I think is the contribution of the progressives. Is there a, re a relevant and coherent response? I think the answer is yes. The relevant response is that not everything um, can be done or ought to be done by, by government, and particularly at the, at, the, at the national level. What history has demonstrated is the extent to which liberty is lost the more you concentrate power in one spot. That is, separation of powers may be encourage dysfunctionalism and inefficiency, but it also encourages liberty. And, uh, but then liberty is not at the highest goal for the progressives. It is a certain degree of standardization, and it's a certain degree of equality, a certain degree of security, is, I think is very important. So yeah, is there a relevant response? The answer is yes. Does liberty matter? Is it, is it a coherent response? The answer is yes. But what has to take into effect that the New Deal, the Great Society Program, or Obamacare, have made an incredible um, uh, impact. And we need to ask the, the, the subsequent question. It's all well and good to say that the framers have been around for 225 years, which they have. But the progressives have been around for 125 years. There is something attractive about the progressives, which, which means that they keep being there as part of the process. And one of the most attractive features of the progressives is it offers up the hand of service, community. It offers up the idea of human solidarity. We are the world. Um, that, that individualism is narrow. That there's more to life than, than this. And, and a lot of us are touched by that. We are open to that kind of argument. And I think that's, it's not, it's not that the progressives, in my mind, are, are secular progressives as much as they are. They offer a different kind of religion. They offer the religion of, of, of purity, of perfection. Everyone, everyone is the standard. No child left behind, not even the dumb ones. <laughs> no obese person left behind, not, all, not even the very fat ones. Uh, we're in for this long run. In fact, I would argue that, that, that uh, that one of the worst turn features of, of American political life is the passage of the 18th Amendment, which is uh, the Prohibition Amendment. And the framers would come back and never recognize that country at all. Uh, and, and it's not just because they drank, which they did, and not just because they drank a lot, which they did. It, 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 it was the water in Philadelphia, you know. But, 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 the, but, the, reason, but the reason is that they didn't think that the role of government was to particularly govern my character. So the churches can do that. Why must government do, do that? The role of government is to stop somebody from picking my pocket or breaking my leg, not telling me how many drinks I should or should not have for my own good. And even then, when you think, if you look at the language of the 18th Amendment, which is fascinating, you had a debate. You think that the 18th Amendment says that alcohol is forbidden. It doesn't say that. So even in the passage of this purification, the folks who have some common sense in a commercial society manage to fight back. The 18th Amendment says, after one year, <laughs> it gives the drunks a chance to hoard. <laughs> after one year, for the ratification of this article, A, the manufacture, B, the sale, C, transportation. It doesn't say consumption. There's three, right? Manufacture, sale, or transportation of intoxicating liquors. It doesn't say alcohol. So it leaves it open as to who is to decide what an intoxicating liquor is and at what level of intoxication is intoxication. Uh, within the importation they are entering, blah, 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 ju jurisdiction for beverage purposes. I didn't say a thing about sacramental wine. The whole sacramental wine industry 
grew up. <laughs> and you, you, you think about it. I mean, they, 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 the Italian Catholics open up Napa and Sonoma wine industry. Right? You couldn't serve it in, the, in, in public, but you could consume it. And church groups grew up. You talk about American enterprise, it grew up. You had Sunday school classes, wine tasting and Jesus. <laughs> no grape juice. This is, this is serious stuff. And, 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 and even, the, even, the, even Jews discovered sacramental wine. I mean, it's really, it's, it's absolutely fascinating. And, which means that even, my, my hope is, is there a coherent and relevant answer? My hope is that even the do-gooders of the progressive who want to cleanse us of all sin have to face the fact we're Americans. Thank you. Thank you.